see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Owen Marcus, who's uh, written an article called Empathy, Men's Secret Weapon. And I'm putting it up on the screen uh, right now. And in, in this uh, article, you wrote about uh, kind of the relationship of men to empathy. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased to uh, have you uh, here for, for a dialogue about how we can build a culture of empathy. Uh, could you maybe just introduce yourself a little bit more, a little bit about your background and so forth? Great, Edwin. Um... I've been doing this kind of work for about 35 years, but really what got me into this was I grew up with a significant amount of Asperger's and dyslexia and ADD and dyspraxia. So essentially what that meant was I was really out of it. You know, uh, I could not relate to people. I could not um, really essentially feel or create that empathy. So as a little kid, I started struggling with what that was and how to do that. And then through college, uh, I started learning about it more in an academic way. Then eventually, uh, when I got into actually body work uh, back in the uh, early 70s, living in Boulder, I started to really be able to feel first in my body and then feel emotionally. And then I had good fortune to study with some of the leaders in the field. And from there... Uh, Today, I'm working a lot with men, teaching men to lead men's groups, and teaching men to learn the forgotten skills of empathy. Uh, I, from my own research and, and working with thousands of men, I've found that often as men, uh, we have feelings. We, one, don't know how to connect to them, and often don't know how to express them, and with that, how to relate to other people and their feelings. Uh, so, so you've been working, uh, creating men's group. Are these are like support groups or dialogue groups or activity groups. Uh, I'm not quite clear on that. Um, well, they can be anything for for yeah. other men, but for us, uh, they're what we call deep groups. So, in a general sense, yes, they would be support groups. They're not therapy groups, but what we end up doing for four hours once a week is have communication around uh, a certain general easy protocol that literally takes these men deeper. So it's my belief that um, it's not telling a man what to do, but allowing him to have an experience, feel it and express it in a circle with other men where not only does he feel safe, but he has other men to model and to support. Well, uh, you, you wrote this article. I'm going to put it up on the uh, screen here for a second. And as I was saying, it's called Empathy Men's Secret Weapon, and it's on your uh, website, owenmarcus.com. And I showed, it, I showed it, it to a couple of other people, and when they saw the, the uh, title, Men's Secret Weapon, it sounds a little bit like a, a, a combat, right? Like you're in a, you're in a fight somewhere, and this is your secret weapon. But really, when I read the read the article, it was like totally not about that. It was like it seemed to be really about uh, getting men to uh, you know start thinking about empathy and looking at empathy and seeing how they could develop it. And I thought it was really well, you know, very articulate and and uh, you know kind of really touched on a lot of really good. Uh, Part, you know, aspects about the relationship of men and empathy. Could you maybe go through the article and just, you know, kind of talk about, uh, you know, just what you wrote there? Um, sure. I, need, I would need to pull it up. Um, what was it? Let me just say what was interesting was that article or that post has gotten the second amount of hits of all of my other posts. The number one post was a post of, that a uh, sex coach did about three or four months ago, which, got a, as you can imagine, a tremendous amount of hits. And her, her post was teaching men what women really want. <laughs> and, this, <laughs> and this post was number two. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'll, um, I'll uh, bring it up. Yeah, I, I have it up here, too. I can actually kind of start with it. You start off by talking about Carl Rogers and person-centered therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, Carl Rogers really had, I, I, he's a kind of a hero of mine as well. You know, he's, he really 
uh, start a lot of the whole work around empathy and really kind of explaining it and showing how it worked with his uh, uh, person-centered therapy approach. He did, and what, as I mentioned in the article, and what I still find uh, apropos with the Carl Rogers is his approach to people in terms of just relating to them and just relating to what their experience is. And one of my uh, trainings, one of the things I've taught is mindfulness. And mindfulness, I feel, is something that runs core to really empathy. And I, you can't really be empathetic unless you feel your own experience. And you can't really feel your own experience unless you're aware of what's happening in your body and with your emotions. And consequently, that's one of the primary skills I've always taught people, and particularly these men. Uh, and that's uh, much of the foundation of this article, even though I don't continually talk about it in the article. Yeah, so it's really about about kind of getting connected to yourself. A lot of times when people when we talk about empathy, it's like, oh, you have to be feeling for others, and people forget about kind of connecting to themselves. And uh, when I talk about empathy, I kind of see it in four parts, like uh, mm. self empathy, uh, mirrored empathy through mirror neurons, a uh, imaginative empathy, which is uh, kind of perspective taking, or sometimes called cognitive empathy, and then empathic action. And in, in your article, you really talked about that self-empathy, that self-connection that happens through mindfulness and sensory awareness and really connecting to what's going on and, and revealing what, what's going on with yourself. Yeah, I, one of my little uh, caveats is uh, I can't feel anyone else or be more empathetic to someone else and their experience than I am to my own experience. Uh, a couple points with that is that it's a very courageous, as you know, Edwin, act to express what you're feeling. And one of the things that I think men need to do is initiate that in a lot of relationships, particularly with women. Uh, obviously, you know, in this culture, men initially initiate asking a woman out. Well, I think it also expands into needing to initiate uh, the emotional relationship, emotional safety, and often empathy. And what I've heard from women over the years, and often um, from men, is that when a man takes that risk and is the first to sort of raise the bar on the emotional intimacy or the empathy, the woman starts to relax and starts to reveal herself. But so often in this culture, we've been trained as men that women are the emotional ones and we just go along for the ride. And when a man can step up, even if he fails, but if he just takes the risk, so often the woman starts to relax in with that is often turned on by a woman, by a man that has the courage to express his feelings. Yeah, so it's really about that. There's something about by sharing your own feelings, it creates a space for others to share theirs. So the deeper uh, we can go uh, ourselves, the more space we create for others to go deeply. I think that's a foundation for me with empathy and really all the work I do with people. One of the other things I, I need to say is that I think there's a dark side to empathy that you don't often hear people talk about. Uh, and that is maybe rolling into sympathy, and I touched on it in the article, where uh, we'll say with men, well, well, and I've seen it with the men I've worked with, you know, they become too sensitive. And I know I was. I started out my whole journey uh, with empathy with emotions and relating to women, being sensitive. And I quickly realized that being sensitive got me something, in part because so many of my colleagues uh, or peers were not sen sensitive, so the women really were attracted to that sensitivity. But what I began to realize was I lost my masculinity and I lost my real sense of self because what I was doing was I was in one way playing a role and also focusing more on their experience and not my experience. And so at first, the, rela you know, the relationship developed quickly, the woman felt this affinity, they felt connected or safe, but after a while, 
they didn't feel me because I wasn't feeling me and I certainly wasn't really expressing my more difficult feelings and m more of my assertive feelings which often are associated with the masculine and so consequently I became very aware of when men do that when they focus too much on the other person's feeling uh, maybe being sympathetic and not taking the risk of feeling and expressing their own feelings well, we kind of jumped right into it. I mean, there's, I was just kind of feeling a little bit like maybe we should step back and look at the whole notion of men and empathy. Um, it's like there's kind of like a stereotype that men aren't empath empathic, uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, that, uh, you know, there's like this sense of competition. Men are kind of uh, raised to be more competitive. Um, you know, what do you think of the overall kind of stereotypes about men and, and empathy? You know, just kind of stepping back a little bit, like what, what's going on in the culture w around this? And Well, I think that's a really good question. I think the culture is changing and, and myself and my colleagues are really trying to lead or at least catalyze that change. Uh, yeah, there's always been this competition with men and there's always going to be. I think it's innate in our nature. How we express it we can change that uh, and we're starting to uh, but one of the biggest things that we're up against is learning how to be emotional and essentially what happened was uh, there was a couple scenarios or, or times in our in our evolutional development where we as men stepped away one was when agriculture came and we went out and started plowing the fields and then the next big one was when the industrial revolution came and we started working 8 10 12 hours a day and we were out of the family one that disconnected the man or the father from his family and his wife but ultimately more so it disconnected the boy to the masculine and how to experience express model that masculine maturity or masculine emotional intelligence and so over several generations if not uh, centuries we've lost that and now for a, a few reasons one of them is because of this whole woman's movement that we've seen in the last 50 years is that men are starting to wake up to well something's missing here and it's the emotional component but now what we're saying and I'm certainly saying is yes there's a lot of similarities between a man and a woman in their emotional experience and communication but there's some distinct differences and for a man to truly be masculine with his emotions he needs to learn some of those distinctions and for the most part he really can't learn them from a woman he can learn them maybe in relationship to a woman uh, but he can't really learn them from a woman. And that's one of the powers of these really deep, solid men's groups is that he gets to model it from men that are doing it. He gets to interact with men that are doing it. He gets the feedback. He gets to screw up. He gets to practice it. He gets the reinforcement. And generally for a guy, within six months, his whole emotional intelligence, and particularly his masculine emotional intelligence, has gone up significantly. Well, empathy is often seen as a kind of as being weak. I mean, that's kind of one of the big criticisms right. I hear. So it's like, well, you know, you can't be empathic because it's a weak, uh, it's a weak, uh, you know, state of being. Whereas um, I, I see it as actually the exact opposite, that uh, to be empathic means to be very grounded in yourself, mm -hmm. very centered, you know, very mindful. And it takes a lot of... Uh, you know, it takes a lot of grounding, a lot of uh, strength uh, to, you know, mm -hmm. it's like to get up and fight seems to be the quickest. I mean, it seems to be the kind of the, you know, if we're talking about weakness, it's like, it, it's like, uh, it seems if, if anything, that's kind of like the weakest uh, kind of way of being. Uh, Edwin, I think you're right. And uh, my uh, colleague and my nonprofit mentor, uh, Ken Sullen has written a book uh, on his men's group and, and that's one of the, also one of his champions is that uh, to express your emotions really takes courage and to go into that reaction it's just a reaction and we've been trained to do that as men uh, but that's not necessarily truly the most courageous act to do. Uh, my second book's on the PTSD and men and I, I've brought in a co-author with uh, that book. And, and in writing the book, I've been reading about and studying these special forces. The, you know, each branch has their own 
sort of elite force. And what's really interesting is that they've completely revamped their training and their development and their continuing ed training, if you want to call it, for these men. And one of the things that they're integrating is everything from yoga to mindfulness to uh, really specific personal training to more rest. And they're, and they're realizing that these men that are in the special forces are greatly more resilient to PTSD or trauma than the rest of the military. And they're looking at why are these elite forces more resilient to stress and trauma than the average soldier. And one of the things that it's alluding to and I see is it's that because of their tight association with their teams, like a SEALs team, uh, that they have to have this empathy and this communication and this trust because their team is only as strong as the weakest man. And a lot of that strength comes into comes from their communication ability. And a lot of the communication ability comes from their empathy. So we've gone full circle. Here we've got the most sort of macho model in our society going towards what you're championing, this empathy. Yeah, what, what I'm looking at, uh, it, it, well, you're, you're kind of talking about empathy in men. And it's like, well, it, it, and a lot of the empathy work that I see is, is uh, kind of organized around kind of a, an individualistic kind of approach like while well, you will learn empathy you'll kind of live a more fulfilling life or or so but i'm seeing that we need to do that as well as create a culture of empathy in right. the sense that you're saying well here's the seals are out there you know they're in battle and they can create empathy between each other but it's really about that con they're, they're going in is into a situation that's kind of like a failure because there was a lack of empathy to create that war to begin with. Do you know what I'm saying? Is that that we need to create a global culture of empathy. Yeah, for yeah. The, oh. I, I get mm -hmm. that. I, I would I would agree that the more empathetic we are culturally, probably the less wars we'll have. And I, what I'm saying is we're I'm wherever I can, I'm leveraging whatever thing that we see in the culture to help change that model of the masculine. Because you tell, give me a war that a woman started. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 the guys that usually start the war. Well, I can tell you, Margaret and, Thatcher, you know, with right, uh, that's so, <laughs> and I think Golda Meir, and uh, I'm not sure about in India, whoever the uh, but right, yeah. So I think we'd all agree that for better or worse, that you know, wars tend to be start started by men, okay, generally, and yeah, yeah and. And if not cognitively, yeah, emotionally, some of it could be traced to the, the lack of empathy and with that, the um, inability to really truly feel and communicate with the other side. Um, and so, yeah, we are sort of swimming upstream with this, but I think we are starting to see at least pockets of change. And my, my motto is, you know, working or changing one man at a time, one group at a time, and in, in the planet. And I can't, in my experience, find a more powerful way to change men than in these men's groups. Yeah. So then, so that's kind of like the large vision I have is how can we, at a, at a large scale, change the society to value empathy so it becomes a cultural value so that, you know, we're talking about it at, at kind of all levels. Right. And then you're talking, you were in your article, you were just really went into, okay, about men, let's address this specific relationship of men and, and empathy. And uh, you went about uh, saying, how can we uh, create empathy? And you went through a series of, of kind of points. And one of them was awareness, and then risk, practice, association, were the kind of the four bullet points. So perhaps we could go through uh, those of, you know, how do men actually create the and deepen the empathy? Uh, well, as we started the, the conversation, I think it really starts with uh, awareness. Um, and one of my little distinctions about that is that, you know, as men, we're used to using our bodies. Now, uh, one of my professions is I'm a rolfer. I've been a rolfer for over 30 years, so I work with people, all, everything from elite athletes to, yeah, I've had uh, special forces 
vets in. So I've had the whole continuum of men. And so as a culture and often individually, men experience a lot of their life through their bodies. Now, grant you that a lot of that experience is either through sports or maybe combat. Uh, but if you take that a little deeper and if you allow the man to relax a little more, he starts to connect to his emotions. And that's what happened to me. It was through body work or relaxing my body that I started feeling and expressing my emotions. So I think a good way for anyone, but particularly for men, to become more aware is to become emotionally or excuse me, physically or somatically more aware because our bodies, our emotions, and our unconscious are all, all pretty much different aspects of the same phenomena. And so anytime you can come at it from a different direction, you reinforce that experience. So I would say for men, the more you can do activities, now yoga is getting real popular, even for men, that slow you down, make you aware of your body, you're almost inevitably going to be more aware, more aware of your body, more aware of what's happening with your body and yourself in the moment, the mindfulness experience, and more aware of your emotions. And as you know, as you become more aware of your emotions, at some point, you got to start communicating them. Yeah, so it's, uh, do you're saying do things like yoga, and mindfulness, um, kind of like maybe mindfulness being kind of out of the Buddhist tradition, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what else? I, I personally, what I do is freestyle dance. So I think, um, yeah. for me, the dance is uh, really great. And I've done uh, contact improv. I don't know if you're familiar with I've done contact that. I, improv. I've done, which I did that. Is, you've done that too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a great way to get into the body where you're always in contact with someone, you're very aware of the, the point of contact and how you're interacting and... Um, well, and, and you know, it demands flow because that contact, you, so you gotta feel yourself and it's, it's a somatic empathy. You gotta feel the other person and then you gotta find that flow. So you're doing three things at the same time, which is not common for men. I mean, about the only time they have some close to that is in sex. Uh, right. And and there's a question of how good that is then. Um, so one of the other things I'd suggest is body work. Good mm. body work is is sort of the shortcut to the body awareness and really the emotional awareness. And one of the things I work with in my clients or two things, really the breathing, which I say is the first skill that we learn and that we forgot. Uh, no one, even these elite marathon, Olympic marathon runners are used to brawl weren't breathing to their capacity. And the other is, you know, the, the relationship with gravity, which is the sec second thing that we learned or started learning uh, after we were born. And so no one, I've had thousands of clients, no one uses gravity properly. So if you think about it, what's our, you know, what's our first empathy or relationship? Well, it's with gravity. And so I, I can literally look at someone and how they move and then their relationship to their body, their movement and gravity becomes uh, a metaphor for their life. And then part of that, it's how they relate and how empathetic they are. So essentially, you could walk, watch a thousand people walk by, and, and I would doubt that you would find one person that was gently leaning forward into gravity or literally leaning into life and putting themselves out. You know, most of us w lean back and with that sort of hold back. So as we, in a relaxed way, get erect and as we start to lean into gravity and we're breathing and relax we innately become more aware and we're more avail available to relate to people yeah so there's all these different uh practices that are out there that can help us kind of get into our body and you're saying like uh uh like massage is it giving massage or getting massage or both or well massage is beginning i, I I love massage. I get massages. Uh, but when I talk about body work, I'm usually talking about something like Rolfing, Feldenkrais work. Uh, things that are more specific and are working on a deeper level. Uh, massage is great, and there's a lot of kinds of massages, and that's a great entry point for a lot of men. And, and so many men that I see, the first thing that happens, when you just touch them like that, they jump because their body is so wound up. And one of the other things that I work with is, you know, the mindfulness, but in the stress is 
this whole continuum of, of stress and, and trauma. And as we all know, there's two survival or trauma responses, fight or flight. There's this third response that most people don't know about, and that's to freeze. And that's what happens in post-traumatic stress, essentially, is that person is frozen. And when they freeze physically, they freeze emotionally. And so a lot of the impairment that we see with people not being able to empathize is really an aspect of either post-traumatic stress or what we're calling the uh, traumatic stress response, which is essentially the same physiology, but not caused by stress, or excuse me, not caused by trauma, but by caused by uh, serial, what I call micro traumas or stress, produces that same physiology where it freezes the body and the mind into physiology. Mm. And one of my other tenets is that it's not psychology, it's physiology. And until that physiology changes, it's hard for a man or a woman to really be fully available for empathy mm -hmm. because on a physiological level, they're still in that survival state. They might not express fight or flight, but their physiology is still wound up as if they're in fight or flight. And so in survival, the last thing that you're worried about is empathy. The first thing you're concerned about is your survival. And, and that gets back to some of the research I'm doing with elite of forces is one of the things they're working on is, is how to keep that empathy going as long as they can and and with that decrease the likelihood of the trauma response and you can literally learn through many different approaches to become more resilient to stress and trauma and with that be more available to empathy yeah it seems that uh, empathy is about having uh, a wide awareness is that the mm -hmm. awareness is open and able to take in uh, input, stimulus uh, from others and from the environment. And that when we become afraid or stressed, that that awareness kind of shrinks. Mm -hmm. and, and you're saying that as that awareness shrinks, that maybe our bodies get kind of stuck in that. Mm -hmm. in that. And that we can, if we loosen up the body, that that awareness can maybe uh, open up again. Is that kind of along the lines? Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's excellent. Um, in the core of that, in the core of what we taught when we taught the mindfulness stress reduction program, uh, I had a, we had a, the biggest company at the, at the time in Phoenix, uh, the biggest one in the country. We didn't make a lot of money on it. It was more of a pro bono kind of deal, but we helped a lot of people. And the core of that course is teaching people to breathe. Because the first thing that we lose in stress or trauma is we hold our breath. And so to keep that open is to breathe. So one of the things that I've always worked on, and I had to with my Asperger's, and this is a, a big part of what healed me, and with all these men, is when they start to feel stressed, to keep breathing. So you got this like dual attention. So one focus is, is on your breath and, excuse me, and uh, being aware and, and if you can, be even being aware of the field or what's outside there. And also, at the same time, you know, expressing your communication and what's happening. But keeping that, that broad awareness of yourself and what's happening as you're breathing. Now, that is a skill that most people don't have, but you can learn that through a lot of the th techniques we were just describing. And when you do that, what was a stressful event which would close you down and separate you from someone, keeps you present. And what happens is the other person, at least unconsciously or somatically, feels that there's a stress, but they see that you're not panicking, you're not going into survival, so they go, oh, I can relax. Uh, because what the studies have shown and my experience has shown is if, if you, Edwin, start to tighten up, I'm going to tighten up. And then we go into this vicious spiral. And if we can, or the longer we can keep that, that stay open and broad, the deeper our connection is going to be. And then over time, we build up this history of rapport so that if something difficult does happen, uh, we're a lot less likely to go into panic. And that's, again, something they're teaching these special forces is under stress to stay connected and breathe. I mean, uh, I think it was, yeah, the Marines, 
that teach this breathing technique. <laughs> they actually teach a breathing technique for their Marines when they're under physical and or emotional stress to get them focused again. Yeah, so it seems like there's just a whole uh, series of things, of, of techniques and processes that can be done to uh, facilitate empathy. It's, and you're, you're almost like you're creating a curriculum for that. We are. Um, I haven't housed it entirely under empathy, but it, it easily could be. And uh, the stuff I want to do with Ashoka uh, is a lot on empathy. And the other part is creating what I'm calling these micro communities. Now, the men's groups that I've created are a, a particular example of it. But a broader definition is one of the other things that happened as our society developed, we lost communities. And one of the reasons I think social media or social networking is so popular is that we're, we're missing this sense of community. And I love social media. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on those forums and I'm all for it. But it doesn't provide the essence of what we're needing and probably the biggest essence of that matrix of what we're missing is empathy and it's really difficult to have empathy in that deep relationship through facebook yeah uh, and so we've not had it for so long as a culture it's gotten so we don't even know what we're missing and one of the things that i've seen in these, you know these really tight men's groups is a deep community develops organically i mean it's not all pro there's no protocol on on it. It just happens through the continual relationship or empathy building, first with the men, and then with the men and, you know, and their families, and then with the families relative to the whole micro community of the men's group. And I, I live in a town of about 8,000 people. Now, my last iteration of, of these men's groups have been seven years. And so within seven years, we've, we've developed this huge reputation in town. And we get men lining up to join our groups just out of word of mouth, in part because they see the community that we've created. And, and with that community, we foster an environment for everyone from the families to, you know, to the men in the greater community to develop empathy. So, so you're saying you create these men's group where men can kind of develop mm -hmm. empathy between each other and they're sort of like getting grounded in empathy mm -hmm. and then they're able to go out into the community, into their families and to a wider community and kind of maintain that sense of connection and empathy. Exactly. And it, one, because you're fulfilling a need that has always been there and, and that relaxes the man and, and everyone else and, and you're teaching skills and it takes it's a bit of a learning curve you know it takes a while but then the guy starts to pick it up and boom he has it and he's and he's we, you know there's stories of men teaching their kids that one of the men in the group recently a couple of months ago was having problems with his son his son's I'd say maybe eight to ten uh, I know the kid is a great kid but he was misbehaving, he was acting out. And, and through the group, this gentleman realized was he was disconnecting from himself and around his son and disconnecting to his son. And we essentially suggested, not in a direct way, but in an indirect way that this gentleman, we'll call him Tom, that he connect to himself and then sit down and just connect to his son. You know, with no agenda, not telling him what to do, not doing a task but just starting to relate to him within two evenings of that two you know putting him to bed conversations the kids behavior changed 180 degrees and and this gentleman was blown away by it he didn't even think it could be that easy and so much more fun and this is a good man he has a successful business a good father but that awareness was completely lacking and let alone the skills. And so once we brought the awareness, he more or less knew the skills and, but applied the skills that he was using in the men's group to relating to his son, that relationship dramatically changed almost instantly. Well, uh, as I've looked at empathy, I've kind of looked at the blocks to empathy and some of the blocks uh, that, have, that keep coming up is, is one analyzing 
right? Mm -hmm. Or trying to fix or to mm -hmm. kind of control or even to sympathize with instead of just kind of be present. So it sounds like in the men's group, this, uh, this person you were talking about, he was learning, you know, I don't have to fix people. I don't have to, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to analyze them. I don't have to give them advice. I just have to be maybe present. And then with his son, he was just maybe just present with his son and creating a space where his son could kind of perhaps speak and be heard. Is that kind of the, the gist? Of That's, you got it right. That's exactly right. Um, and he started, his son started speaking things because it was safe and his father was receptive. And in that essentially non-judgmental or non-reaction place, non-survival place, and he was as open. And, and if he felt any kind of stress, he would just breathe and, and he relaxed more. And the more he relaxed, the more the sun relaxed. This is just like I was saying with men and women. You know, even though men traditionally have been high on the empathy curve, when a man starts to become empathetic, there's a huge amount of impact he has on his family uh, with his kids. And this same man has had comparable stories that he's told with his relationship with his wife from just being empathetic. And one of the, and I love this, he invented this himself. One technique he used was giving his wife a massage. And he had the, the men in the group in tears just telling about the experience because that physical contact, like you were talking about uh, improv, but you know, the massage, he, be, he had to be present, he had to be aware of himself, his wife, she opened up. And it was like going in the back door, as often ba uh, body work is, and immediately they just developed this deep empathy that they hadn't had in a while. And it's literally, he said it was like they fell in love again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so instead of just talking about things, they were kind of connecting at a physical level. So, so not, not all communication is, is kind of this verbal. There's a physical uh, energy kind of exchange, maybe, and how that happens, if it's happening in a controlling way or an empathic way. Exactly, and, and you can't get, you know, give good body work by you know, being controlling. You gotta be in relationship to the person you're working on. And you can't receive good body work unless you surrender control and get into relationship with the person giving it. Um, in spite that, you know, as men, we tend to be tighter than women and often were adverse to body work, men respond real quickly to good body work and they start to relax and they develop the somatic communication that you're talking about. And when you have that kind of communication, the verbal communication or empathy is really easy. Well, uh, in your article, you know, the first um, point you had was uh, awareness and then you went into uh, risk. Um, mm -hmm. You see, what do you say here about risk? Uh, is it what do you mean by risk? You... Um, what I mean by risk is that, uh, like I was saying earlier, you feel something, and at some point, particularly for men, I, I would say he has to risk expressing that feeling, and that's really scary. And so, I know for myself, and I looks like I've seen it with hundreds of other men. We, we get into this situation, we had this feeling, we want to express it, we had this like, innate urge to express it, and then it's like our demons or our saboteurs come up and go, oh, I can't say that, and then there's like this mini panic, and then this like internal debate, do I say it, do you, and, you, know, you know, and it's going in our head, but it's also going on in our body, and unconsciously the woman's going, what's happening here? Where if, if you just sink down, like you said, just relax as much as you can and just blurt it out and what I encourage men to do in the beginning is if it even means blurting it out blurting it out and it might be off the mark but at least you got something out and you can keep refining it and it's a skill that you build you build so over time I went from literally just blurting it out and, and the women's rolling her eyes but staying engaged to being able to really articulate my feelings right from the start but that skill didn't happen without taking those risks of failing and, and part of that risk for men comes from the fact that, oh, if I say something, you know, and I put my foot in my mouth or, or you know, I, I um, get her pissed off, and then what do I do? And that's a real panic for a lot of guys because our default is to just disengage, which will piss her off even more. And 
I'm not the only one who talks about this. Men and women have talked about how women test us, us men, through challenge. And some will say that they need to occasionally just get mad and get upset. Um, and we, being who we are, sort of literal, linear, we can take what they're saying in a literal way and focus on the details and not really feel the emotion behind it, which is really what they want and what they're sort of covertly trying to teach us. But when we can relax, feel their emotions and say something like, well, honey, I, I see that you're really upset here. Uh, can you tell me more about how you're upset? And you, and you start having a dialogue about the emotion, not about what you were saying or, or Edwin about how we want to fix things because that so often is our default as guys because we want to show our love and concern by fixing a problem and so often a woman or like in this case this gentleman's son wanted just to relate and so that is a very risky thing for men in the beginning until they get some history there. Well just a thought that was coming up about the fixing that actually empathy does fix in a way, in, in a different way that it's not controlling, that the empathy is just having that sense of empathy creates a sense of calmness and a sense of connection. And the oxytocin uh, kind of fills mm -hmm. your body. And, re and so in a sense, it fixes without fixing, consciously fixing. It fixes it kind of like an emotional level. So... Um, I think that's a good metaphor. It's like getting the nutrient that your body needs rather than taking a drug. And so your body absorbs that empathy and, and it fills the holes and, you, and, you, and that person starts to relax um, and starts to feel heard and, and starts to feel connected. Um, and out of that, yeah, most cases the person fixes their thing themselves. Yeah. <laughs> And that's one of our tenets in the men's group is we don't fix. Don't, don't tell the guy what to do. Don't give him a solution. Take him deeper. Because my belief is if we go deeper, if I go deeper into my own experience, I will find my own resolution. It might not be immediate, but I will at least be on the right track. Well, something that uh, came up when you were talking about um, in terms of sharing your feelings, like you're talking about in a relationship, is... There's a lot of stress about you know how that's gonna how that will kind of what will happen. Um, what I found is that by kind of stepping back and like you're talking about in a men's group, where you can actually share that to begin with with someone mm -hmm. else and be heard and be empathized with, that it kind of create it kind of fills an empathy battery. You know, it's like so that when you do go into that situation, that you've already been heard about it, you've already felt empathy around it. And that that empathy kind of comes in and, and makes it a little bit smoother. So it's, it's really important that, uh, to have those places where you can, um, you know, get empathized, be heard, uh, be seen, be felt. And it sounds like that's what the uh, men's groups that you're doing are kind of. A yeah, that's a lot of it. And, and in specific, yeah, what I attempt to do and, and, and teach is it, Particularly if, you, if I had something difficult to say, difficult for me and or difficult for the listener, I leave with an emotion. And so he's not going to have more empathy, at least initially, to me than, than I have a risk having with him. And so I might, you know, if we're having a difficult conversation, Edwin, I might say, Edwin, you know, w last week when you did X, I felt really scared. Mm. I, and then I might explain that in another sentence or two. And, and right there, I opened myself up emotionally. And I, and I created the emotional context for that conversation. Now, what you do, how you respond is your choice. But you're probably more likely to respond in an emotional way than some kind of justification or fixing or, or you know, an argument or, or a re rational way. As, as you know, as well as I do, it's just going to go around in a circle. Yeah, so it's uh, really that part of sharing yourself is contributing to the to the developing of empathy. So we need to. So it's it's learning how to uh, share those feelings that we have that actually creates. Again, we were kind of talking about that to begin with. Helps create the empathy 
the environment for empathy. Um, another uh, point you had here, I saw that it, on, uh, on practice, you talk about practicing, that we need to uh, practice on an ongoing basis. And it said, you said something about, um, I think it was about authority. Was that, did I see that? Was that? Uh, you, you're probably correct. Uh in part because of my dyslexia, I just write these things in the moment, and I, and it's from my experience, so I don't remember exactly what I say, but um, just give me a little context. Yeah, let me just read it here. Context. Uh, go from being empathic with your friends uh, to strangers, then to people in authority. Uh, don't make it a new mask you wear. Always stay connected to what you are experiencing. Always forego sounding good for being honest. I just wondered about yeah, authority I, because when I grew up, I you know I, I kind of grew up in a German household, and you know authority mm -hmm. was a big thing. You had to respect mm -hmm. authority. You know I'd feel kind of nervous around the police because oh they're they're, they're authority. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of mentioned that about authority, it just kind of rang a bell. Like oh yeah, how does empathy relate to authority? I think that's what I was sort of talking to was that. Uh, we develop the skills and then maybe the final test of it is around authority because I believe we all have I don't know, call them issues, but some kind of response around authority. Um, and what will happen often around authority is the man or for that matter, a woman will go into that stress response or you know, PTSD kind of physiology and shut down. And so if we can, know that on some level that you know i'm shutting down or, you know I, i'm reacting you're if you're if you're the authority figure i'm backing away i'm reacting or maybe my reaction is to challenge you whatever my basic style is i'm probably going to be doing that and so i breathe i connect to my own experience and go oh i'm mad i'm afraid what am i feeling and this all can happen in a split second and then challenge first that authority within me, that, that, that authority kind of experience, and go, okay, what do I need to do to develop this empathy, this relationship? And which is going to probably come back to risk, and risk on an emotional level, because one of the things that often happens around authority, we shut down our emotions. And we might give our power away to our authority in the sense that uh, it might become a fundamentalistic thing or it might become a very specific situation where I let you take over because you're the expert. And I let go of my experience and my communication of my feelings and my needs, not just my feelings, but my needs. Or those feelings and needs come up and then some part of me challenges the expression of them because you are the authority. And so my instigation there is to challenge people and saying, challenge the authority that, that you're confronting, you know, with your empathy. One of my first experiences in a men's group years ago was this fellow that had a PhD. He owned a very successful training and consulting company. And he was one of these big barrel chested guys that that would walk into any room and you know, innately try to lead everyone and tell everyone what to do. And so he's telling everyone what to do in the group. And he's doing that for weeks and weeks and weeks and, and people would challenge him and then he'd back down a little or that person would back down, but he, you know, this, I'll call him Ed, Ed would never back down. And then one day I go, well, I see this pattern and, and no one's able to relate to him. And so I challenged him. And so I started pushing and pushing and pushing until he, but not in a hard way, just asking him questions about his experience. And finally he relaxed and we became best friends. And then he said, you know, you're the first guy in the group to really relate to me. And so on the other side, often the people in authority want people to relate to him as not being the authority figure. Because they're often hungry for that kind of intimacy, that kind of relationship or empathy. And, and I've been, and you've probably been in, in positions where you were the leader, and everyone puts you on some kind of pedestal. And with that, you lose this empathy, and you lose connection. And when, when someone starts to step up and say, you know, you're not my superior, but you're my equal, and they, and they start relating on that level, 
I start to relax. Yeah, I see that in in politics too. There's a, you know we put politicians up there, mm-hmm. and then then it's like how do you undermine them? So there's this dynamic of put people up and then see how you can fight because it's kind of painful that the alienation that happens, and it's like we need like a new way to uh, relate. I think I think the people in in power they need the empathy as well. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. so how, you know, to uh, create a dynamic where where we're empathizing with people uh, in power. What one way that that one technique that I I learned uh, before going to some situations was to have a a dialogue with someone where they ask, what will keep you from seeing the humanity of the people Mm -hmm. involved? So if you're going to, you know, your work, you're going to be talking with, you know, someone in authority, a boss or whatever, or another uh, environment like that, is to have a, that pre-empathy session hearing where you say, what will keep me from seeing the humanity of, of that person? Because what we really want is to see the humanity of everyone. And there's all these blocks and that authority is like a block to that seeing mm-hmm. the humanity uh, of others so you're right and and we want others to see our humanity and it's it's like who you know i'll show you after you show me you know i'll open up after you open up and what i teach and, and i try to practice in these groups is the guy who takes the risk of revealing first or risking your or, or going into empathy is the one that gets the coup, the, the power. Uh, and I say that because, again, men are competitive, but so that's a given. So why can't we, in, an, in a fun way, compete around being empathetic and taking these risks and, and being the guy that, that connects with someone uh, that's an authority figure, that's in stress or whatever, in the empathetic way first, that really, as you're saying, Commit, connects to his humanity from his own humanity. Yeah, so, and, and you're focusing, on, it's, it's also not uh, sacrificing yourself. It, it's it's right. holding your own humanity as well as kind of as e- an equal, uh, holding it consciously with awareness, both at the same time. So, you know, if we talk about uh, the strength of empathy, I think that's, that empathy is a strong state of being because to be able to do that, to be able to hold your own awareness and the mm-hmm. awareness of others and multiple others is a real, I mean, to do that is a huge, is hugely strong. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's just to do that. I, I think I, I'm kind of a, a looking at that constant uh, criticism of empathy as mm-hmm. it being a weak. And I think maybe what people are confused about by the weakness is they think that with empathy you're sacrificing yourself for someone else and it's really not what it's about it's not about self-sacrifice of what's going on it's holding it both uh at the same time exactly yeah exactly you're you're holding your experience their experience the bigger field and the more you can hold and and be present the stronger you are and the more courageous you are and people will challenge you society will challenge you but that's what the real heroes are doing. Uh, they're, they're holding their vision and their, and their empathic connection to their own vision and sharing it as a gift. And whoever wants to receive the gift receives it. And they keep, you know, they keep sharing it and expressing it and risking it. One of the other aspects I'd add to empathy beyond feeling is needs. And I don't think need to get an, enough face time. I mean, we, we don't really often talk about our needs and I think they're particularly important for men and so that means we need to not only know what our needs or wants and desires are but also being willing to express them so we got the ability to express our emotions but then we also has have the ability to express what we want and what we need and one of the sayings that we have is you might not always get it but so often the risk of expressing it shifts the energy. Often, you know, once I express it, my need to get it will significantly decrease. The energy of the interaction in the room relaxes because it's often it's the 
elephant that's been sitting in the room that finally gets acknowledged and everyone can relax because a, a lot of true empathy for me is, is telling the truth when the, the truth is difficult, speaking the lies that others don't speak. And the man who speaks the unspeakable is very courageous. And, and often it's around a feeling or a want. And, and what are those needs? What do you mean by, by needs? I mean everything. I mean everything from survival needs to emotional needs to material needs. Uh, and we judge those needs. Uh, and so in, in that judgment, we often hold them back. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. particularly the emotional needs. Um, and then the old masculine archetype or the macho uh, archetype, men don't have needs. Uh, it's that we're very self-reliant. It's, it's like the old cowboy archetype, alone on the prairie. I don't need anyone. I can survive the wilderness. I'm hurting this herd. I'm doing it myself. Uh, I'll take care of everyone, the animals, everyone. Yeah, I got it handled. Yeah. Well, I, in terms of the needs, I actually, I, I see empathy as a need. There's, I think somehow mm -hmm. we're biologically wired to uh, need to be heard, to be seen, to be felt. So it, uh, and... Uh, I would agree. So that... Yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, that's... I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I would agree that, yeah, it is it's a need. It sort of overlaps. Uh, and it might be a real fundamental need, particularly on an emotional front. And in my work with relationships, the biggest breakthroughs that I see is when the two partners get into this realm of expressing their empathetic needs. And so often they start to find out they have similar needs. And one of the, the little tricks to that is if you get two people to talk about their values, you start with what do they value? Because that's a need. Uh, maybe a dormant need, but a, a value. And more often than not, people find that they're pretty closely aligned and they get a lot of power from hearing the other person's values. And they get a lot of empathy or understanding about why they're doing certain behaviors. But we don't ever think about talking about what we find valuable. Yeah, that's one of the first things I usually ask people is about their values. What's the most important mm. thing uh, value to them and really try to hear that. What's your most important value, Owen? Good question. <laughs> um, empathy is a real, real important value. Um, truth is a real important value. Um, speaking the unspeakable. Uh, service is an important value. And another one is supporting people in their greatness. Um, I see that within all of us is a dormant, not just desire, but ability to create something great. And when a man or a woman connects to that part in them, that really deep center uh, that starts to wake that up, and that often could be a little scary. And so one of the my roles for the last 35 years is supporting people and and hatching or birthing that greatness so what are your values Edwin uh right now I'm like totally obsessed with empathy it's like everything <laughs> it's like it's like I, I eat sleep and breathe empathy just looking at it you know having these dialogues and kind of really kind of uh have become obsessed with it um you know I grew up in a, a kind of a conservative evangelical household mm -hmm. uh you know and was you know kind of had those blocks around me and I, I left, uh, instead of going to college, I went to uh, travel around the world for 10 years. And for mm -hmm. me, that was kind of like this opening to kind of see that, you know, life was really about uh, people's values. It was exactly what you were talking about, that it was the values that, you know, connecting with people in, in you know, in Indonesia who are Muslim or in India or mm -hmm. in China or Russia or, you know, Aborigines in the outback or... You know, there was really just this common humanity. And, uh, you know, when I started kind of exploring these uh, themes and, and topics, uh, I really came to see that empathy was was kind of like this central value that uh, that I'd always been really, in, you know, been really about, you know, that I've been kind of like, I guess I was kind of like searching 
you know, it's mm -hmm. like I knew I wanted something and it was really when I kind of came across, you know, empathy and learning how to be more empathic and mm -hmm. that it was like, this is what I was looking for. You know, it was this, this sense of connection and how to deepen connection. And maybe, you know, I tend to take things to the extreme and now it's like, well, let's create a whole culture of empathy. Let's raise the value of empathy within society. So, um I, I I love it. Uh, it parallels me, and so you're an empathy geek. <laughs> an empathy geek. I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, empathy geek. And um, you know, well, I I I'd been to places like Esalen. I don't know if you're familiar with the, mm -hmm, you know. So mm -hmm. I did, you know, really got into the. You know, Esalen's big on massage, you know, and all mm -hmm. the somatic experiences, and into contact improv, and into dance, and and, and the arts. So. Um, I didn't have the vocabulary, you know, for what I was kind of like, kind of looking for. But now when I kind of got into empathy and I started finding this vocabulary mm -hmm. and all these processes and, you know, all the things you've been looking at, you know, and you're actually creating uh, lessons, I mean, activities and groups. And, you know, it takes that whole infrastructure to mm -hmm. transform society. So I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, being able to talk to you about this and, I uh, hope we can kind of continue this conversation and maybe, you know, I was hoping that maybe even do some panel discussions, you know, bring some others in and, uh, you mm -hmm. know, really bring this up because I think it's so, you know, on I have the, the Facebook page uh, for empathy. I would say it's like 70% women who take part in that. So I really think that this whole uh, part about empathy in men is just so critical if we want to transform society. I think you're you're right on as far as I'm concerned, um, and and as you were inferring, you know, empathy is not a, a didactic phenomena; it's an experiential phenomena, and we can learn about it through reading things, and I'm all for that. You know, I read a lot, but really to learn the skills, to embody the skills, you you need people to be empathetic with or to, and you you know that's difficult doing that, you know, by ourselves or just through the internet, and it's and so one way to look at these micro communities or specifically these men's groups is a intense course in empathy. You know, it, it, you know, it starts out in one way as remedial because particularly for men, but in general for the society, we're behind the empathy curve. Uh, and you, I'm sure, saw that with traveling. And also, you know, we need an environment that's safe where men can not only model it, learn it, and, but practice it and screw up. Uh, because, you know, as you said, you know, when you grew up, at one, you, know, you didn't really have that environment. Uh, you, you were taught other things, unintentionally or indirectly, but you learned other things. And, and part of your path has been unlearning yeah. what you learned and learning what you didn't get to learn. So my first book is a, essentially about teaching men or laying out for men what we didn't learn. And what happens is when we don't learn something, and it's not our fault we didn't learn it, most cases, it wasn't there to be taught, or if it was being taught, because of the stress and trauma, we couldn't learn it. So we didn't learn it, so we, ha we have gaps in our maturation. And whenever we have a gap in our maturation, it's like we have a hole. And, and then we develop compensation or, or coping mechanisms to survive. And part of healing really is going back and filling those holes by learning what we didn't learn. And I find that a theme through a lot of those holes is empathy because you could understand this to learn these skills almost always involves the skill of empathy in terms of being able to relate to a person on that level so you can learn that skill well how, how do you see your work going forward now what's uh, on your kind of on your agenda on your with with your work you're doing these groups and you have your Facebook page. Uh, with, I have like 5,000 people. I think you've maxed out on your Facebook. I have. I, I maxed out about a year ago. Um, um, I'm doing several things. I just got a call right before we got on this call from my partner, Ken Solon, who's also in the Bay Area with his the partner in the Men's Corps. And he just had a call from a TV producer in New York that wants to do a TV show with us on, on men in the wilderness and, and like a group and survival and all that. So that might be some. Uh, I'm writing about and want to do more with micro communities and take the, 
the skill set that we develop with the, the men's groups and expand it beyond and, and just sort of make it non-dominational and teach people how to create a micro community so they can have the learning, the support, the empathy, uh, and really the love that they didn't often get and don't have in their current life. Uh, one of the big things is this men core, this nonprofit, and going out there and teaching men how to start and lead powerful men's groups. Um, I'm, my book right now is with a publisher, and then hopefully, you know, they're going to pick it up. It looks like they are, and then I'll publish the first book, and then I'm writing on that, writing the second book, or about a third through that second book on PT, PTSD in men, and basically just showing men that you know a lot of what people have told us about how we're screwed up is really not a psychological phenomena, but a physiological phenomena, and there's some simple ways to change that. Uh, and another thing that I'm working on uh, with my group and others is really coming up with a way to create that really embodies a lot of the things that we don't think or associate with uh, creativity. One of them is empathy uh, and, and being able to connect deep into yourself and, and the balance between healing and creating. Because often you get the whole genre or discipline of healing and then you get this whole one of creation and they often don't come together, but when they do come together, uh, it's exceedingly powerful. It's more fun and quicker and more sustainable. And so I'm um, developing a platform for that. Um, and there's some other you know, secondary things I'm working on. But all of it is around men, and, and much of that's around you know, allowing men to learn how to be empathetic. Well, Owen, this has been uh, really a pleasure uh, talking to you about this, and I, I hope we can continue perhaps more on these one-on-one uh, -on -one dialogues and maybe bring in some other uh, men as well and uh, maybe even have a, a mini uh, men's group here that we could record on, on Skype right. would be kind that of That would be great. That would be the first time. We were going to do a, a – I put a panel, panel together for South by Southwest, and we almost got accepted. Uh, around some of this, uh, and maybe next year we will, because uh, I think when when men can learn the skills of empathy, uh, we'll be much better off than we have been. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing in empathy in general, and and you know willing to hear me rant and rave about men in empathy. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.